Thank you so much for the invitation to um, present this video. Um, this is a talk on GERD physiology in the context of morbid obesity. Um, I have a disclosure, but not relevant to this um, topic. We will define GERD. We'll then talk about the normal anti-reflex mechanisms. We'll then talk about how those mechanisms can go wrong. And then in particular, how those mechanisms go wrong in the morbid obese population. What is GERD? There have been several attempts to define what exactly this is. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. There's um, the Brazil, Montreal, and Lyon conferences. Um, SAGES or American College of Gastroenterology um, has a definition that draws from um, some of these concepts. Um, so 2006 um, was the published um, Montreal definition. Um, and I would say that that is the consensus conference that's most um, often cited. Um, the SAGES 2010 guidelines draw from the Montreal consensus statement a condition which develops when the reflux of the stomach contents cause troublesome symptoms and or complications. They go on to say from a surgical perspective, GERD is the failure of the anti-reflux barrier allowing abnormal reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus. It is a mechanical disorder, which is caused by a defective lower esophageal sphincter, a gastric emptying disorder, or failed esophageal peristalsis. The American College of Gastroenterology states that GERD should be defined as symptoms or complications resulting from the reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus or beyond into the oral cavity, including larynx or lung. GERD can be further classified as the presence of symptoms without erosions on endoscopic examination, non-erosive disease or NERD, or GERD symptoms with erosions. We have to think about the uh, normal anti-reflex mechanisms as uh, mucosal defenses and mechanical defenses. So we're going to go into the uh, anatomy of uh, the normal anti-reflex mechanisms um, more than we are the mucosal defenses. The anatomy of the esophageal gastric junction is pretty complex with the esophagus terminating to the stomach um, at the Z-line. We have the internal and external components of the lower esophageal sphincter complex. We have the phrenoesophageal ligament uh, with its upper part inserting uh, on the esophagus several centimeters above where the uh, muscular sphincter is. Then we have the um, stomach which um, has a component of the lower esophageal sphincter with the sling fibers uh, extending um, onto the um, cardiac region. The lower esophageal sphincter complex has several components. We're going to talk about it in its at rest closed position. Um, so we're not going to talk about um, really what happens during a swallow, what happens during a TLESR. We're just talking about at rest, how does this thing function? Um, so the lower esophageal sphincter um, internal sphincter has several components, um, which you can see in this pressure profile um, has um, an asymmetric um, distribution uh, of pressure. The internal sphincter is comprised of smooth muscle and has two components. The first is the lower esophageal circular sphincter, which is above the Z-line. Its length is about three and a half centimeters and it is the thickest of uh, the components with about one and a half millimeters of muscle. The second is a more complicated sling clasp mechanism, also comprised of smooth muscle. This is in the gastric cardia and is generally below the Z-line. So it has a thickening of muscle on the lesser curved side, um, right at the GE junction. And then we have the oblique sling fibers, uh, which extend onto the stomach. And in a complex um, oblique and circular configuration, 
we get a closing motion. The curl diaphragm is striated muscle and is the external sphincter. Um, this can generate much more pressure than the internal sphincter can and is responsible for preventing reflux during stress episodes. The amount of intra-abdominal esophagus has been shown to be important in preventing reflux and in physiologic models that have shortened the intra-abdominal esophageal length, it takes less of a pressure gradient to produce a reflux episode. The lower esophageal valve requires intra-abdominal esophagus, the angle of his to be an acute angle, um, which requires the sling fibers to be intact, um, and it does require a mucosal flap with the grades one and two being functional valves and grades three and four not being functional. There's an expected amount of gastroesophageal reflux that happens in normal individuals. Um, for this to not be pathological, the esophageal mucosal barriers need to be intact. The motility and clearance mechanisms need to be intact, including saliva production. The lower esophageal sphincter needs to have a normal structure and pressures. Um, so that's two to four centimeters in length um, and about 10 to 30 millimeters mercury um, of resting pressure. There are normal uh, lower esophageal sphincter relaxations that are not due to swallowing. These are called transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. Um, they are the mechanism for gas venting and um, this can be termed belching. Um, they're stimulated by distension of the cardia in the body of the stomach, not so much the antrum and not so much the fundus. Um, the expected acid exposure of the distal esophagus is about 40 episodes per day. You can see the Demeester uh, normal values on the right. GERD pathophysiology is complex because GERD is not one problem. It is the final common pathway of multiple dysfunctions. Sometimes these can be um, isolated and sometimes they can be multiple and sometimes they can overlap causing each other. So um, impaired esophageal clearance and esophageal dysmotility um, can contribute hypotensive LES, can contribute hiatal hernia, increased pressure gradient. So that would be either high intra-abdominal and or low intrathoracic, frequent transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations or duodenogastroesophageal reflux, um, which uh, can cause even more problems uh, than acid can. So bile is more irritating carcinogenic uh, than acid is, leading to things like Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. Um, GERD is hard because GERD does not equal symptoms. So we can have asymptomatic reflux. So uh, Barrett's esophagus is asymptomatic in about 25% of cases. And symptoms don't always equal GERD. Um, so you can have classic heartburn symptoms without pathologic reflux. These come in a couple flavors. So reflux hypersensitivity, where um, acid exposure has symptom correlation, um, but uh, it's not pathologic acid reflux. It wouldn't um, qualify uh, in acid exposure time or Demeester score. Or there's functional heartburn, where um, the uh, symptom association is not there, uh, but the symptoms are classic for heartburn. This is a figure from a recent review article that drives home the point that GERD does not always equal symptoms, um, that Barrett's esophagus can have a pretty high percentage of asymptomatic patients with pathological reflux, and symptoms does not always equal GERD, where functional heartburn with negative symptom association can manifest as GERD symptoms, uh, but have nothing physiologically wrong. So what are the pathophysiologic mechanisms of GERD and obesity. We have to think about GERD again as the final common pathway of multiple dysfunctions. So here's some things that have been shown in obesity. So first off, there's reduced esophageal clearance. There's a high prevalence of motility disorders um, in morbid obesity, and the most common is hypomotility. There's an increase in transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. The frequency is associated with increased BMI and abdominal wall circumference. There can be a compromised lower esophageal valve because of the blunting of the angle of his just because of the excessive perigastric fat. 
There's an increase in the hiatal hernia rate in obese patients. This is probably due to increased intra-abdominal pressure causing separation of the esophagogastric junction and the curl diaphragm. They've been able to show that this happens in overweight and obesity versus normal weight individuals. And so if you think about that as the phrenoesophageal membrane kind of wearing out over time, that's probably what's going on. So there definitely is an increase in uh, the gastroesophageal pressure gradient. For every point increase in BMI, there's a 10% increase in the intragastric pressure. And there's a linear correlation of intragastric pressure with BMI and waist circumference. We do know that as weight increases, GERD increases. So higher BMI is not only associated with more reflux symptoms, but for every five BMI point increase, the Demeester score increases by three units. So what is different between um, patients with GERD that have morbid obesity and patients with GERD that do not have morbid obesity? This is a study that answers that specific question. It's a retrospective review of 599 patients with pH proven GERD. What were the differences in pH and manometry between patients with a BMI less than 35 and greater than or equal to 35? It's kind of surprising. So when you look at patients with morbid obesity, their lower esophageal sphincter pressure is a little bit greater in patients without. And these are, again, all patients with pH proven GERD. Hypotensive LES only accounts for 38% of patients with morbid obesity. Hypertensive LES happened in 23% of the patients. Hypotensive distal esophageal amplitude only happened in 10% of the patients with morbid obesity with a much higher uh, distal esophageal amplitude on average. So when you put all these things together, the authors suggested that it's a compensatory mechanism where um, the distal esophagus of a patient with morbid obesity has to work really hard to counteract all the increased intra-abdominal pressure. And that intra-abdominal pressure is likely to be the driving source of GERD in the morbidly obese population. Again, no single dysfunction leads to GERD and Increased intra-abdominal pressure is likely the predominant pathology driving GERD in morbid obesity. Thank you very much for your attention.